Welcome back to the Skid Factory, where today we're starting a new build. Here's our donor engine that we're going to start with. It's um, been brutally torn out of an old VT Commodore. Um, with great care. Uh, we're not too worried about it. We'll probably throw most of the stuff on the outside away and just, we just got this particular engine because it's a VT um, 304, so it's got a roller cam in it instead of a flat tappet. Um, no idea why they did that late in the day. It was pretty much just about when they were about to shut shop on these engines, but they did it anyway, so um, we there's plenty of them around, so we just grab one of these. They cost the same as all the other ones. So um, this, the old GM ECU, it shares a lot of stuff with any of the other GM stuff that you might see in the States, all the actuation and how they how they control everything. It had a 4L60E transmission behind it, which we may end up using one of those anyway. Um, this will go in the bin though, because we'll use a proper ECU on it. This is sort of like a, you can flash tune these things, like actually pull the chip thing out of them and it's just like the worst thing in the world. I don't know how people did it back in the day. So that'll go. The wiring loom's not looking great, so we'll probably just toss that as well and start again. Uh, most of it's actually probably gonna go in the bin because we got, got plans for her. Um, we don't know what they are yet, but Something big, maybe not big, but better than this. So this, this inlet manifold is known as the bunch of bananas in Australia. Uh, it was bought out in the VN engine when these first came out. Um, it's actually a pretty good design, although it does get restrictive in the, when you're trying to make a bit of power on it, but it makes really good torque. It's got very long runners um, that sort of come down into, into a pair of sort of low plenums. It's still got a dizzy. And it's very carefully hidden back here and is one of the most difficult things you'll ever have to experience is trying to get into the back of this when it's inside a car. So um, we'll probably retain the distributor just, just so it looks old school. Um, the car is a nice old thing, so we don't want to go putting LS coils on top of the headers and making it look like an LS1 because no one, no one wants that. So let's get and rip all these wires and junk off and bin them and uh, see how dirty it is underneath all that crap. I bet it is. It looks pretty dirty. That might have been what that noise was. So this is the this is the big difference between the VT and the previous engines. This thing here, that's the plate that holds on to stuff to make the roller lifters stay in the position they're meant to be. That's a pretty elaborate looking thing. I've never actually seen inside one of these before. I thought you would have pulled apart like 50 of these in your garage as a kid, in your youth. No, I had a VN. It was earlier than this. It had flat tappet. Did that charcoal grey, grey colour? No, it was rose grey, so it was like this bizarre sort of purpley sort of grey thing. It was a fashion of the time. We used to wear like onions on our belts as well when we went out to the dance. No flat brims around? No, thankfully. Let's have a look inside this here distributor. You can't really see much but it's actually got a, a uh, external eight pole hall sensor and then inside it there's another hall sensor um, that splits the cycle so 
that these were the only ones of the 304 injected engines that were uh, sequential. Uh, previously, they were just batch fired, like just the injectors were grouped and the Dizzy did the rest. So, um, an emissions thing, I'd, I would imagine, but um, we'll use it to a, with our fresh ECU that doesn't have GM hamsters inside it. Are they the same hamsters that was in the VL ECU? Uh, a bit newer than that. New age? Yeah, a bit fitter. Gen Y? Probably, oh, they might have been Gen X hamsters, so they probably were sipping lattes or something instead of exercising. So initial look says it's not too bad. Uh, the engine is actually very clean inside, so it's obviously been serviced well. Um, it's virtually Vegemite free inside the, the valve covers and that sort of thing. There's a fair bit of uh, like build up in the inlet ports and the bores are pretty glazed. So it's probably been burning a bit of oil. Um, there's still a bit of cross hatching in there, but the, the glazing is pretty bad. So. Um, what we wanted to do initially is just make sure it, it hadn't done 500,000 Ks and had a big lip underneath it that would require us to um, like rebore it and put oversized pistons in it. Uh, so we just wanted to have a quick look and see whether that was going to change the scope of the whole, whole thing, but um, it, it looks pretty good. We'll um, continue pulling it apart and have a, have a good look at it with all the pistons out and make sure there's no issues further down or anything like that. But Looks pretty good, I reckon. The the guy that I got it off claimed it had 190,000 on it, which, which means nothing when you're buying something off Gumtree or, or Marketplace. But um, yeah, it looks pretty reasonable. Hopefully we'll get away without having to spend too much money on it. This is the last of this engine. So basically these were superseded by the LS1 engine, which everyone loves. Um, so this is the last generation of them. These were actually designed in the 60s. They came out in 1969 as a uh, 253 cube, so 4.2 litre and 308 cube, five litre engine. Um, first Australian built V8. Um, the engine is, it's kind of designed as a conglomeration of all the GM engines that were available at the time that the, the local GM engineers um, in the 60s got a selection of GM engines, so all the, the Chevy, Oldsmobile, Buick, Pontiac and Cadillac engines, grabbed a sample of all of them, did a bit of head scratching and basically kind of cherry picked bits, that they, bits of design that they liked. So there's bits of it that are kind of like a 350 Chev and then there's other bits like the front cover sort of layout and where the oil pump is, it's more like a, a Buick or Pontiac engine. Um, some of the parts are actually even can be used on really old Pontiac engines. They're, they're that close in design. Um, this is a very well supported engine in Australia. It's kind of an iconic thing, which is why we wanted to do something with them, especially now that it's 20 years out of production. Um, so this is actually a 304 cubic inch engine. And the reason for that was in the eighties, um, they used these in touring car racing in Australia, which was a huge thing. It's like our NASCAR. Um, immensely popular, um, was always used to sell vehicles, went on Sunday, sell on Monday. Uh, and in when they changed over, uh, I think from Group C to Group A regulation, uh, one of the racers, Peter Brock, who is an absolute Australian icon, he's a legend, um, now sadly passed away. He figured out that if they dropped the engine below five litre capacity, so it was 5.066 or something like that, um, 5,066 cc's down below five litre, then he could have a 75 kilogram weight saving on his car 
or on everyone's car. So he managed to convince Holden to change the engine so it was below from 308 down to 304. So obviously had a lot of sway because it's not something that they would have just kicked off on doing so, uh, sort of a, a major engine change. So that's the history behind that. It was then known as the 304 or they called them a five litre by then, but it's actually technically 4.9 litre. So um, that engine went through, that still had the older style cast iron heads, which, which were shaped more like a Chevy, like a small block Chev. So it had um, like ports next to each other, inlet ports next to each other and exhaust ports sort of grouped um, rather than um, being symmetrical or linear, which these new heads are like an LS1. Uh, they eventually, the engine wasn't suitable for um, the unleaded. They had difficulties getting the old heads to work with unleaded. They had to drop the compression ratio as well because unleaded fuel was nasty. They ended up with a real dog of an engine that had 120 kilowatts or something. It was a little bit better than the, the VL six cylinder engine uh, and not as good as the turbo six cylinder. So they embarked on uh, a redesign then to get get it ready for the the 90s era of, of Commodore. Um, got to keep in mind that back then the Commodore was a huge selling vehicle. It was basically Commodores and Falcons were the duck's guts. Everything else was a smaller car that didn't have a V8. So it was, they were big sellers. They put a lot of effort into both engineering and marketing for them because of that. So what they did was redesign the heads and they changed the cylinder heads so they were all the ports all the combustion chambers were the same so on the older sort of small blocks and stuff like that you'll have a couple of spark plugs coming in one direction a couple of coming in from the other direction um, that's great if you're just pumping fuel through an air and making power but when it comes down to emission control to get everything every cylinder to work exactly the same with the same measured amount of fuel they want every chamber to be the same, so every, everything's identical. So that, that's the design logic behind that. And surprise, surprise, the LS1 ended up like that as well, and for the same reason. So big changes. Um, injection, that was one of the major things. Um, you might have seen the bunch of bananas manifold. Um, actually quite a good design and worked perfectly for what this engine was designed for, which was like effortless low down torque. It wasn't a big power engine particularly not by today's standards but it was very smooth and torquey and got reasonable fuel economy for a v8 uh, it ran the 808 um, delco injection system which was what um, small block chevys would have had in them from the mid 80s sort of the the good ones the tpis and that sort of thing so just a recalibrated version of that um, and they made about 165 kilowatts which sounds absolutely pathetic today but it, it was a very a talky bottom end power engine and they actually were quite good performers in the car back then because the cars didn't weigh very much they were only 1300 kilograms or something for a, a fairly large family car so they really did the job i had one a vn commodore which was the first to come out with this this um redesigned engine uh when i was 21 so it was my first v8 um, I thought it was pretty reasonably powerful and did like excellent single peggers everywhere because the diffs never worked. If they were a limited slip diff, they didn't work and most of them weren't limited slip anyway, so same, same. So um, yeah, they were a pretty good thing and um, they were very durable as well. They lasted a lot longer than what the older engines did because they had good combustion control and that sort of thing, so they didn't wear out as easy. Um, so. This is the last one, and the only difference with this is they changed to a roller cam. Um, Marv tells me that that was because HSV, which was the performance variant, wanted roller cam engines for their um, particular vehicles, which were, um, they were like a 350 cubic inch engine, like a 5.7 litre, so they had a stroke of crank in them, um, and more high performance stuff. And at the time, Holden was phasing out the engine, so they didn't want to have two different uh, machining processes for the different engines so they just made them all like that um, so roller cam good thing 
may as well get the newest one we can, even though it's 20 years old. So here it is. Let's pull it to bits and have a bit better look. Crusty. See this goopy rot on everything? That's stuff that you're supposed to put on all the bolts because Holden never liked to give any guarantee that any bolt hole wouldn't go through to a water jacket because it may, depending on who was drilling the hole on the day. So if you don't put stuff like that on, it's, um, it's basically like, a, like an aviation sealer, but it's very thick. Um, Holden had a, we had a, I used to work for Holden uh, for a service center when I was young and um, we had a big giant goopy bottle of it that you had to stick on every bolt that you, <laughs> that you undid when you put it back in again. And I was just thinking it took them like 28 years of making this engine before they put a proper belt drive system on it. And that was only just before they stopped making it. Maybe they didn't plan to stop making it. Maybe. That's one for the conspiracy theorists and or Marv. This is the Holden style oil pump. Um, it looks very similar to at least a Buick one. I've, I've done a Buick engine in, in a Trans Am that had this, this sort of setup on it. It might have actually been mounted to the front cover. But um, yeah, that's the reason for this is they must have known that they were going to put them into a car that had the sump with the well at the front. So this is out of a Commodore. Um, so a 350 has got the, the oil pumps inside the oil pan or the sump. So that's poking out down there. That's perfectly fine if you've got your well there, which just about every um, like GM vehicle do, did back in the day. But if you want to put that well at the front, you can't because there's a pump there. So I think Holden's obviously known that, that things were coming that in 1978 they bought out the Commodore which was a required a front sump and this, these were fitted to them as well so um, I think they were kind of had a bit of forward thinking going on when they were using bits of the other GM designs rather than just they could have just put 350 chevs in them if they wanted to or 307s or whatever but they didn't so um, everything's for a reason this is the thing that doesn't pump oil unless you pack bass in it and makes people that have Holden th engines hate life when they're trying to get their brand new engine started and won't have oil pressure. Was that a shout out to Dave? <laughs> no. Dave, Dave had an LS. He's, he's only didn't have oil pressure because he forgot to put the oil gallery Welsh plug in. <laughs> Does this thing work? Look at that. What a retaining system. How much schmutz do you reckon is going to come out? All of it. Did you even drain the oil? Yeah, but that doesn't mean anything. It's like dust. <laughs> <laughs> She's a bit dry. Nothing. I was just hoping that someone had put a 355 crank in it and rods and pistons and stuff and, a, and used a four bolt block, but they didn't. Looks very clean in there, I must say. Hmm, it's pretty good. It's got a double row chain on it. I don't think they had that standard. Might have been a VT thing, though. Because this is like so old, like 1997 model, like haven't stamped anything with numbers like like the 1985 model engine that we did for the VL so you got to there's a stamp just there what are you talking about that yeah I've put that there just before you told me that you had an engraver so I'm going to have a crack at this and see if I can 
not draw turbos on everything with it. Like a boss. I'm not sure it's the best one on the market. But no. You know what I got that from? Aldi. <laughs> Cost me like five bucks, bro. It was a score. It's already paid for itself. Turbos and everything. Genuine? Rebuild? Um, I think it's got a genuine part number on it. The first dodgy bearing, Alan. It's probably the worst one we've found so far. Right in the middle of the engine. It's getting very low on the... That's on the um, piston side. And it looks like it's galled up a little bit and dragged a bit of the soft metal bearing around. But the crankshaft looks okay. Yeah, it does look alright. So that's super hard. This is not. So bearing damage is not good. But it also doesn't mean that it's a throwaway item because one's soft and one's hard. That's how it works. Woody was just gasping at the finished quality of the crankshaft on this. Looks like someone's got in there with a grinder and taken off the casting dags and stuff. And that's as far as they went. Um, yeah, it's not a Japanese engine. That never will be. They just aren't built the same way. Um, this is probably the nicest Holden engine I've ever seen as far as finishing, machining quality and everything. Um, so they did, they were getting a lot better in the, in the latter days but um, it just wasn't a thing. They, they did their job, they lasted. If there was a race engine, you had to do it all yourself. Whereas a lot of the Japanese stuff is that close to being, the, the, the tolerancing and everything they've done to them from factory is that good that, that, that it's close to what they used to call a race engine in, in this sort of era. Um, they did actually make this uh, engine into a 355 that they called, they gave you a blueprint option and that was basically you paid a lot of money for this weird yellow Holden with bat wings and stuff on it and then you could pay another 15 grand and they would actually build the engine properly. So it was an option. <laughs> they called it the blueprint option which is basically tolerancing it. So um, yeah, they were never as good as a, as a Japanese engine. How's that um, for an upsell? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> uh, here in the block, you can see uh, in sort of about 1994, they changed the casting. That, that relief there never used to be present. That is to clear the rod bolts on a stroke of crank. So when it's a 350 or 355 or whatever you want to call it. A 355 is actually a 30th hour over. I think it is um, 350 350 stroke the stroke of a 350 which i can't remember what exactly that is and if i didn't say it in inches no one would know what i was talking about um, but they basically made it the same stroke as a 350 chev um, and that that relief was put in there to clear the the um, the rod bolts crank out now yep The main caps are numbered. Feels like it is. It's still a rope seal. When they did four bolt mains on them, it was actually just machined into the into the block. Um, there was probably a different casting because there's probably not enough meat to hold the main cap. So just these three center mains had it. 
and they would machine an extra bolt and a wider and it probably had um, see these receivers they would have been machined into it as well um, so not as it's actually a bit of an argument I, I don't know that much about old V8s like this but um, apparently making caps like that with splayed um, machining so the bolts come in in different directions is stronger than a six bolt main um, so that's what an LS Next block has got, apparently. As, as I said, I'm not an expert on V8 racing engines, so get onto those comments and say I'm wrong. I'm sure there's gonna be plenty of guys. Call me an interested observer rather than an expert. <laughs> oh. We got a bit of bearing wear there, but that's, it's just age. Um, nothing out of the ordinary. The worst bit was that one rod bearing. Um, so I don't think we got anything particularly to worry about with this engine. It should be good to go as long as it's not rotted out on the inside, which doesn't normally happen in Australia. We're pretty good, as far, well, we're pretty good with coolant for a start, um, being well trained to use it. Uh, we don't have corrosion issues with with things in general because it doesn't snow or do anything stupid like that in Australia. Well, not here anyway. I don't know about those Victorians or Tasmanians. Yeah, but it doesn't snow much there either. And I doubt they're driving holding V8s down there. They probably end up in the bushes. Everything's looking good with the block. We'll pop the Welsh plugs out and um, make sure there's no nasty corrosion inside. It has had a, a little bit of a Welsh plug leak here and there. One's been replaced. That's pretty common on an old thing like this, so we won't, we're not too worried about it, but we'll check anyway. Um, pop the camshaft and the lifters out, um, think about what sort to replace it with. I might talk to um, Marv about that, see what he's got to say. I'll probably get the bores measured up by a mate of mine. Get him to look at those pistons that are weird looking. Make sure that they're not something that should be thrown in the bin. And then we'll think about putting them back together. That'll be next time. Thanks for watching. Oh, come on, my pretty. You walk over there. <laughs> Bastard. <laughs> yes. You said something about force induction before too. Um, Possible force induction, I think the words were. Nothing's off the table. Uh, we don't know, I don't know yet. It takes a lot of negotiation to get these things past people, you know. Except for you, I just make you do it. <laughs>